Welcome back to our continued discussion about waves and sound. Last time we discussed the speed of a standing wave on a string, such as a stringed instrument like a violin or a viola, and we talked about the fact that it had to do with uh, the tension and also the mass density on the, on the string. And we talked about how an increase in tension then would make the wave go faster. We also said that that speed is related to the frequency that's ultimately produced on the string, but that also has to do with the length of the string. And so uh, we use that, for example, to illustrate why a large instrument with very long strings has on average a lower pitch, such as a cello or a string bass, compared to a smaller instrument with shorter strings, such as a violin. And for those musical uh, nerds out there, this also explains why when you press down on a string and you put your finger, say, here and compress the string, you are effectively making the length of it shorter. And so, as such, it will become higher in pitch. Now, the same equation will apply to wind instruments as well, um, but this time we are looking at the length of a tube and generally speaking these wind instruments have uh, holes drilled through the tube which makes the effective tube length shorter. That means that when you add your fingers to say a flute or a clarinet you're typically making the effective tube length longer by closing those holes off. As a child, this confused me a lot because I couldn't understand why adding fingers to a viola would make it sound higher in frequency, higher in pitch, but adding fingers to my clarinet would make it sound lower in pitch, lower in frequency. But you can see through this equation here why this makes sense. It all has to do with the inverse relationship between the length and the frequency. So once you set up this vibration, what actually occurs? Well, you're producing a sound wave that then propagates through the medium, typically through air. And as a wave, we've talked about how a sound wave is what we would call a longitudinal wave, meaning that it has areas of compression or condensation and then areas of uh, where the wave is more spread out and we would call that rarefaction. You can think about this as pressure waves for sound so that this condensation is associated with a region of higher pressure and this rarefaction is associated with a region of lower pressure. So once your ear detects a sound wave it will analyze how loud it is and what its frequency is. So how loud it is is going to have to do with the amplitude. Now of course we're going to talk about more more about this uh, in the next lecture but this has to do not only with the amplitude produced by the sound but also how far away you are from the sound. The details of that we'll talk about next time. Um, but the pitch that you hear has to do with the frequency but also some some subjective qualities that the brain has to interpret in order to figure out what it would call the pitch. Uh, so if you took an example of a few different sound waves like you're seeing here with A, B, and C, you might call the first sound wave noise. Your brain would interpret this one, A, as noise. And the reason for that is because there's really no discernible frequency at all here. Now B, the sound wave depicted in B, is what your brain would interpret as a pure tone with a very clear sinusoidal regular frequency that's easily discernible. Now that doesn't really sound altogether that musical, believe it or not, um, because it's almost too pure in a way. Uh, a typical musical sound does have a regular discernible frequency. You can he see that uh, here in choice C, but it also has some little imperfections here and there, some dips and rises uh, on top of that regular frequency.
The details of that are what your ear will discern as the timbre of the musical tone being produced and that's part of what helps you distinguish between something like a trumpet that you hear versus say a violin even if they're playing the same note you can kind of tell the difference between those instruments. So the brain has to do a lot of interpretation and so you may have heard of this con controversy of the Laurel versus Yanni uh, recording where different people's brains interpreted the recording differently. Some of us heard Yanni, some of us heard Laurel when we heard this recording. So I would encourage you to take a look at this YouTube link here and it goes into an explanation of why that is and what the actual recording uh, was, what the person was actually saying in, in the original recording. But suffice to say there are other frequencies going on in the recording which uh, is what, a, what a, caused this controversy to arise because essentially what has to happen is your brain has to pick out which frequencies are most important to pay attention to and some people's brains uh, cho chose frequencies that correspond to the word Yanni while other people's brains interpret it differently and pick out the frequencies that correspond with Laurel. And it's not just humans that have to interpret sounds. Um, Animals interpret sounds as well, and uh, there there is there are useful applications to this. So one way in which people are trying to repopulate uh, coral reefs that are dying is to put recordings that have loudspeakers attached and produced sounds that they know that fish and other species interpret as being sounds indicating a healthy coral reef in order to lure them to another place and repopulate that coral reef. Aside from interpretation, there's also limitations as to what we can actually hear. So the human hearing is is uh, the human hearing range is what we would call the audible or sonic region of the sound spectrum. There are sound waves that exist that we cannot hear, just there, just as there are light waves that exist that we cannot hear. At higher frequencies than what we can hear, we have ultrasonic waves, and at lower frequencies than what we can hear, we have infrasonic waves. These prefixes, by the way, are also used with light. Think about the visible spectrum of light, your Roy G. Biv. Well, R stands for red. What is lower frequency than red? Infrared. Uh, the V stands for violet. What is higher frequency than violet? ultraviolet. So these are the same prefixes that we use for both light and sound. Um, so some other animals can hear some sound waves in the ultrasound. That's the premise behind a dog whistle, for example. It's a higher frequency sound than what we can hear, but dogs can hear it. And infrasound, um, there are lower pitches than what we can hear. That's, for example, some larger animals like elephants can actually hear. Once the sound wave is produced and it propagates through the medium, the speed with which the sound wave travels will depend upon what medium you're talking about. It will depend upon uh, various properties. First of all, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas, and also the density of that medium. And so for a gas, which is where we're typically hearing sound, uh, it has to do with the density of the gas but also the pressure of the gas. So if you recall from your chemistry classes, the ideal gas law implies that if it depends upon the pressure of the gas, it's likely to depend upon the temperature of the gas as well and that is indeed true. So uh, the speed of sound at room temperature is going to be 343-ish meters per second but at higher temperatures it might be faster than that and at lower temperatures it might be slower than that. That can all be figured out through this equation right here. Regardless, there is a finite speed, sound of speed, uh, speed of sound I should say, that we can actually, unlike light, exceed. 
And so if you have some sort of high speed jet, for example, you can have what we would call supersonic flight, meaning that the jet outpaces the sound wave it is producing. When that occurs, you have some cone shape here, like you're seeing depicted here, where there's constructive interference and all of these compressions and rarefactions can be heard at once, um, and that's what we would call a sonic boom. Now for constructive and destructive interference to occur, one of the underlying assumptions that we've made, if there are two sound sources or two light sources, or two any wave sources, is that they have the same frequencies. If you have two sound waves that have different frequencies, they can produce what we would call a beat pattern. And that happens because they become out of sync with one another and that out of syncness takes on its own frequency as you're seeing depicted here. Now the size of that uh, frequency is going to depend upon the difference in the frequencies of the two sound waves to begin with. And so the objective to tuning two different musical instruments is to make their frequencies be the same. And in doing so, you will reduce that beat frequency down to zero so that there is no off-cycleness occurring. The final topic I wanted to mention today is revisiting this idea of resonance. And so with resonance, we talked about this as it applies to, to s waves in general and also a little bit as it applies to sound waves and basically the idea is that some driving frequency if matched to the natural frequency of the, of the system will produce a high amplitude result that we would call resonance. We talked about it with a playground swing for example. Um, this can also happen with other musical instruments or um, cavities. For example, uh, if you make a sound wave at the right frequency so that it matches the resonant frequency of a glass, you can shatter the glass with your voice. I invited you earlier to take a look at this YouTube link uh, where Physics Girl does this. She has no particular musical training in order to do this. Any of us can basically, if we know how to match the frequency of the glass, we can achieve this glass shattering resonance uh, effect as well. Next time we will discuss the last two topics related to sound having to do with, as I mentioned earlier, the um, loudness of sound and also what happens when the sound source is moving.